I'm gonna press it again. We see the loading again. And here is the S&P 500 price, right? Hello and welcome. This is day 46 of 100 days of code in IoT challenge. I'm Thomas and this is the channel that educates you on IoT and web development by showing how to build projects step by step. For more content like this, make sure you subscribe so you'll be first in line when it comes to the channel updates and new videos. And now, let's get started. So what I'm gonna be building today is an info screen that shows a live data downloaded from the internet using ESP8266 microcontroller. With the device, we can use the button to switch between the views presenting different kind of data, such as weather, crypto prices, or stock market indexes. And all of that with the use of just a few hardware components and a slightly more code. But yeah, enough for overview, let's go ahead and start building it. So here is everything that we need. As I mentioned earlier, it's not many hardware components. We've got ESP8266 microcontroller, micro USB to USB cable to connect the controller to my computer, a button, OLED screen, model SSD 1306. Resolution of this one is 128 by 64, so it's bigger than the one I used yesterday and day before yesterday. And finally, I've got a bunch of wires. I think it's uh, around eight or nine of them to connect everything together, which is something I'm gonna do just now. Okay, everything connected. Let me just quickly go through it, starting from the microcontroller, right? Everything really starts from the power supply and that power supply is really the power rails of the breadboard where we have these two wires connected to microcontroller, right? Which is 3v3 and grunt. So whatever is connected to the minus rail is gonna be connected to the grunt of the microcontroller and whatever is connected to the plus rail of the breadboard is gonna be connected to 3 volts power supply. Right, and that's really the case for the button. As you can see, we've got the green wire connected to D5. That's gonna be set to pull up mode and the white wire going to the ground. Then the screen itself, VCC red wire connected to the plus rail, ground black wire connected to the minus rail, which is the ground. And then this is actually important. We have SCL a blue wire connected to D1 of the microcontroller and SDA yellow wire connected to D2 of the microcontroller. Make sure this is connected exactly like I have connected it. Otherwise the screen is not going to work. Okay, so the last step is gonna be for me to connect microcontroller to my computer and we can switch the view to the code. It took me a couple of hours to make everything work, so I won't really be doing it from scratch again here on the video, but instead I'm gonna do a proper walk through the code and explain how everything works. Also, feel free to download this code and play around with it yourself. There is a link in the description of the video to the GitHub repository. But yeah, now let's get started. So what I've got opened is a platform io.ini file. So yeah, this project has been created based on my template. You can also find it on my GitHub. A template for um, ESP8266 projects with the unit test configuration. Um, however, I've done some modifications to this config file, as you can see here. So I've got monitor filters that is new. That was for me to uh, debug the code and check the exception messages. It's not really needed anymore. Then for the build flags, I've got C++ 17. And uh, this is actually very good news. So I have upgraded everything. Uh, I mean the, uh, the platform Espress if A266, uh, the framework Arduino and platform IO. And now we can use C++ 17 in the platform IO projects with ESP8266, which is really good. And I actually used one of the features in my code I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, log level, I set it to debug, but it doesn't have to be anymore. 
and uh, this bit, which is the most important here. So these are all the dependencies, all the libraries I installed with platform IO. And what we've got here is a um, default, default one on the template, which is a Google test for unit testing. Then I have three libraries from Adafruit. If you remember from the past two videos, these libraries are required to display information on the OLED screen. Then I've got Arduino JSON because we're calling web services that uh, respond with JSON. And uh, finally, UniUno rapid prototyping uh, library I have built. And uh, this is mainly to uh, connect to Wi-Fi and make HTTPS request, right? HTTP secure request. Cool. Okay, so that is on the platform I.O. Let's move to main.cpp. And on the main.cpp, I'm, I'm going to start on the instances creation. As you can see, I added some comments to make the code even more readable, especially in the main.cpp file. And what we've got here is um, a standard instances from the UniUno library. So we've got the Wi-Fi connector that requires Wi-Fi adapter. This is to connect to Wi-Fi and HTTPS client uh, for which I've done a few modifications. And one of the most important modification is on the uh, certificate store. Because previously you had to initialize it yourself. Now it's not required anymore. You can just pass little fs as an argument in the constructor and HTTPS client is going to uh, do everything for you essentially. The only thing that needs to be done is a, a begin method that needs to be called on little fs. But we're gonna we're gonna move to it later. Right. And then um, this one you might not know what it is. So executor is um, a, an object that allows us to put the futures on the loop function, right? Because HTTPS client send request method returns a future. It's like a non-blocking request that is happening happening in the background, and it resolves eventually. Executor is gonna be the object to make sure that future is resolved. Like it's it, it just keeps pulling it until it's resolved or rejected. Okay, the next section is about the display. So for the display, it's just a standard instance creation on SSD1306 from Adafruit, where I pass screen, a screen width and height. And this SSD1306 um, OLED helper, I've just spotted a bug in here. Oh, actually, this is not a bug, it's OLED, so it's fine. And um, this one is the helper I created with a single method that allows us to display text uh, in a single method call, right? So as you can see, we just need to pass text, coordinates, size, and uh, the reset is, is for uh, either clearing the display or not. As a default, it clears the display. Then I have a static JSON document that is to read the data from the web services. With, um, this is pre-allocated on the stack with a JSON size that I put to 4096. And make sure you don't put uh, 8 kilobytes because with 8 kilobytes uh, my, my board just kept dying because it ran out of memory. Um, this might be due to the UniUno library which is still not perfect on the uh, memory optimization. But um, with four kilobytes, it's working all fine. It's actually more than enough. I think with six kilobytes, it's it, you should still you, sh you should still get it to work with six kilobytes essentially. Six kilobytes essentially. Okay, and now this is really the subject. This is really where the the main fu functionality is. So I've got this slider object. I called a slider. And um, why slider? Because what we're really having on the screen is, a, you know, slider functionality from the websites, if you think about it, right? You just display a certain screen, and when you press the button, it goes to the next one. Then you press the button, it goes to the next one, right? You have only one button, you can go to the next one only, but it still is a slider. It's still, it, it's still, it still is a slider, isn't it? So that's why I called it slider. That makes sure we switch, we can switch between the screens. And also, this ensures that if we go to the last one and we try to go to the next one, it's going to go back to the first one, 
Okay, but yeah, I'm gonna show you uh, the tests, how I did the test, and explain how this works. Right, a slider takes a, a vector of screens, and those screens essentially they all API screen because they make HTTPS request and uh, read some JSON from the body, and then display, then display something. But this is really a responsibility of the displayer, which is another another class that I created. I'm also gonna explain why I created it and how this works. But essentially, that's the concrete implementation. This is where we have the concrete implementation. And uh, I actually implemented all of them in the main.cpp file. So yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go through them at the end. But yeah, now let's jump to setup. So setup, we have a serial monitor initialization. We set D5 the input to input pull up. This is for the button to work. We initialize the screen. This bit clears the display when we start. So when you supply the power to the device, little fs begin. This is needed to the certificate for the for the HTTPS client to be able to read certificates from the from the SSL certificate store. Um, and that is also important to have the data folder in here with the certs.ar uh, downloaded using the Docker command that I've created. Have a look at the description of the video. It's all explained there. You essentially need to upload a file system image to the device before you upload this code to uh, make HTTPS communication possible. And uh, yeah, finally in the setup, we've got the access point that we add because we need to connect to Wi-Fi in order to be able to access internet web services. Is button pressed function. This is from the uh, previous videos that just checks if the digital read on D5, if the D5 is put to low, because normally it's put to high. And when it's put to low, that means someone just pressed the button. Okay, cool. So now the loop function. So for the loop function, uh, what we do, we constantly check if the button is pressed. And if it is pressed, we call next screen on the slider. And that's something important on, on the next screen it does return an optional future. So that's where I used uh, C++ 17 functionality. And this is because the next screen, what's happened under the hood, is a non-blocking operation with the future involved. And we don't know when this is completed. And because of that, we don't want to start the next operation. We don't want to start loading the next screen when the previous screen is still being loaded, right? So uh, the next screen method makes sure in, inside the slider makes sure that is not going to happen. And essentially I've got the flag in there to check it. And uh, if there is a screen already loading, there's not going to be any future. And that if statement is gonna it's not going to evaluate, right? Because the future is going to be false in here. That is thanks to the optional that we return for the future, right? However, let's see, there is no, 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 no screen being loaded and we get the future. What, we, what we're doing is we set the loading on the display, right? To, to show the user the message that something is loading. And we put, this is where we put the future on the executor. Right, an executor is gonna make sure that that is gonna be resolved in a non-blocking way. Schedule on the loop function. Right. One important thing to mention is a bug that I spotted on the futures implementation, or maybe it's more on the HTTPS client. So um, apparently, if there is an error with a HTTPS request, this error here is gonna be empty because it goes out of scope be before that it reaches to to this to this callback right so that's going to be something i have to fix with the either with the error or, or https client so that's why i just i'm just displaying a simple error if there is something wrong right and as you remember from the past few from the past two videos a delay is required to not get this code evaluated um you know a couple hundred of times when you press the button but just a single time Cool. Okay, so that is on the on the on the main.cpp, and let's have a look at the slider now, right? So for the slider, I'm gonna open the file, and 
I'm going to open the slider test as well. So as I said, what slider does is it returns the future when there is no new screen be being loaded right now. Okay, so if there is a screen loaded right now, we should not get um, we should not get the the future, but the optional should be empty. And this is this is the second test case, right? So we have text next slide next slide does not return future when there is other screen being loaded already. Okay, that's why I'm checking for the asset false in here. And that's why I'm checking for the asset true in here, right? In here is just a one screen. And that one screen is loaded, right? Immediately, because there is no other screen being loaded. In this one, I've got two screens. I start loading the first screen. Okay. And that is a future that is gonna never resolve, right? Just pending all the time. I do two polls and then I check if I get false for the next screen. That means it's it's empty. There is no future on the optional when uh, there is a other screen being loaded. And the first the third case, which is, which is about the circulation. So this is where I check what happens if we get to the last screen and we try to go to the next again. And what should happen is should go to the first screen when the last one has just has been loaded, right? So that should jump back to the first one. And now let's have a look at the implementation of this. So as you can see here, I've just got the Boolean flag is loading that is set to false as a default. And uh, if it's set to true and the next screen is called, we just return empty optional. Otherwise we set the flag to true and we change it to false once the load method on the screen, on the single screen, the one that we passed, the ones that we passed in the constructor is loaded, right? The future resource. Then we change it to false. Uh, what makes sure that we don't go out of the reach of the vector is this if statement. So basically if the index is higher than the screen size minus one, we set it to zero. So that's going to make sure we load the first one if we get to the end, if we got to the end. Okay, now to the screen, right? Because screen is what is loading when there is nothing else loading, we load the screen. So let me show you the screen now. Here is the interface, right? Pretty straightforward, it's just a load method that returns a future that takes void and returns void. And the implementation of that interface, which is API screen, right? In our case, in our case, it is API screen because we're trying to call, we're sending the request essentially to a certain web service and we expecting to get some JSON response from there. Okay. So yeah, API screen, what API screen does, it takes HTTPS client static JSON document. This is where, this is the document that it writes to once the request, uh, once the request is, is finished and the response has been received. An API displayer, which is another type of object. This is where the concrete implementation happens. And that is really responsible for uh, returning the request the actual request that needs to be sent with HTTP client and to display the information that has been deserialized into the JSON, right? That reference we passed to the API screen, right? So this is like a common functionality for all the screens that we have. The test for it is uh, slightly more complex, but let me show you. It's just a single test case. So here we just make sure that it loads the request, uh, that, that it requests the data using displayer and parse the JSON response. And uh, what's really happening is on the expectation of calls. Okay. So we've got our API displayer and that displayer is just some test displayer that I imp implemented here. Essentially, I created a mock out of it, right? So we've got a test, we've got the control of a get request and display. And what we're checking is if the get request has been called, okay, we make it return expected request. Then we check if APA displayer has been called with the display and that display contained a reference 
to the JSON document. And the final expectation is on HTTPS client, right? Which is this one, this call. We're checking if the send request has been called with the same expected request that the API display display returned. And, and we make it return the future, right? So this is just to to make sure uh, th this is all in line with the with the implementation right with, with the interface of the load method and i'm just resolving the the future in here right so this is only the assertions are only on the expectations for the api screen and again api screen itself is just making the request and deserializes the json and all the display the, the information display happens in the displayers so the concrete code is located there right we've got the weather api displayer that takes the oled screen on the get request what we do we just do a simple get and this is the case for all of the displayers this is just a guess the get request to the certain endpoint what I've got for the weather is an open weather map. This is the one that seems the, the most popular. I had to create an account to use uh, to, to generate API key, but yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Here it is, uh, what happens in the browser when you call the URL. So you get the JSON and uh, what I'm displaying on the screen is the description, the weather description, right? Bear in mind, this is uh, first, right? That's a collection. So we have weather zero description and a main uh, temp, which is the temperature in a Celsius degrees. And this is reflected in the display. So display using the OLED screen helper is displaying weather zero description. That is the top row, right, of the screen. And then the bottom row of the screen displays the temperature right in here so main temp and the city at the very bottom right the city at the very bottom stock index api this is a uh, yahoo finance bit more complicated uh, response right you you can see here right so it's spark result zero response zero meta regular market price I format it to to be uh, to display dollars, and uh, we really have a two piece of information. So S and P five hundred at the top of the screen, and then location zero twenty four. Right, this is Y coordinate. I display the actual price with the dollar uh, at the beginning, and then BTC API displayer. There's a free API from the CoinDesk. That is almost identical to the S&P 500. And finally, Dogecoin, which is again uh, pretty similar to BTC, but um, a slightly different API. Okay. So yeah, so that's essentially it. And this solution is extensible, as you can see, right? So you can, you can add your own displayers, displaying other type of data. So it's not limited to to crypto or stock market or weather, you can have air quality or like essentially whatever you can think of. Um, what you need to do is to create a displayer that returns a request uh, with the get request, right? It should even work with the uh, with the API keys uh, that you need to put as a header because you can prepare the request in the get request method. And uh, then on the display, this is where you try to display it on the screen, right? But again, that doesn't limit you to display it on this particular OLED screen. You can connect another screen, have multiple screens and make the displayers showing some information somewhere else. Also, you can have a multiple instances of slider for, for, for more screens and so on and so on, right? So this is extensible solution. Okay, however, there is one thing that you need to bear in mind and something that I'm gonna have to fix. And that is on a, um, on the type of uh, HTTPS-based APIs that return a JSON, but they don't return the response length, the response body length 
um, in the headers, right? There is no header with the length of the of the response body, and for those for those um, there is something weird happening when we read that body. We get some uh, three characters. I'm not sure why we're getting them. So um, so make sure that if you want to use API, make sure that it doesn't respond with minus one content length header, but it gives the actual content length. Otherwise, you're probably going to have to work this around somehow and uh, probably uh, create a different type of a display that is not based on API displayer because you're going to have to change that response body that you receive before you can pass it as a JSON, okay? But I will try to figure out, no worries, and uh, I let you know if I do. Cool, yeah, so that's everything from the code. And uh, as I said, again, feel free to add more info screens, right? And to display information in any way you, you, you would think of, right? You can display bitmaps here, um, but you know, instead of using OLED helper that I'm using, you can just use the um, this one, right? SSD 1306 straight away. And then you, you have basically more options to display whatever you like. And now before we finish, I guess you would like to see it working again. So let's switch to the breadboard view. So here we go. The sketch is deployed on ESPA266. Everything's ready. I'm just gonna have to press the button. And we've got the loading message. Let's give it a few seconds to load all the data from the weather API service. And there it is, right? We've got overcast clouds, 14 Celsius degrees in London. I'm gonna press it again. We see the loading again. And here is the S&P 500 price, right? 4,166 and 45 cents. I'm gonna press it again. BTC as of today is $35,000. And again, let's see the Dogecoin, 24 cents. Okay, so yeah, it went down recently. I hope it's gonna go up soon. Cool, okay, yeah. And the uh, last press on the button should get us back to the weather. Cool, we got weather information now again, which is the same because weather hasn't changed in my location. Yep, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video and you find it useful, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you will stay up to date with all the new videos.